Good morning, church. Very, very blessed that we're all here. There are many states and many cities throughout the country who are not able to meet, who can't meet, whose governments are breaking God's laws. But uh, one little thing I wasn't planning on, but uh, I'm going to tell you about John MacArthur's church in California challenged. Uh, they uh, had a lawsuit against the governor of California for um, religious persecution, and they won. So they are meeting freely and openly. And uh, I hope that's just a start for the rest of God's church to take the cue and meet like we're supposed to, because we are to serve God first, Caesar second. Let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll get on with this. Dear Father God, Lord Jesus, we are so thankful for all you are and all you do. You are, your grace and mercy goes beyond all imagination. We're so thankful for the opportunity to meet here as a church body and that we are free to do so. Lord, it is by your hand that all this is happening, Lord. We pray for our country the leaders of our country, that your, your glory will be presented one way or another, Lord, that is all for your glory. And Father, I pray for your, for your spirit to be with me and let me, just let me give your word in a manner that you want to see it delivered. Lord, we thank you in all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today's, uh, today's sermon is on faith and obedience. And uh, so I'm just going to start off with some basic things here. Um, the way the, the, I looked this up in Strong's, uh, Strong's Concordance, and uh, the faith, it, it's used in several different ways, um, just as in, in the Bible and in secular terms, faith, belief, trust, confidence, fidelity, and faithfulness. And uh, there's really no one who doesn't have faith, even though they claim they don't. Uh, they might say, well, I'm an atheist. I have no faith in God. Well, they might not have faith in God, but Every time they get in their car and turn the key, they have faith it's going to start and run and drive and take them where they want to go. So that is some kind of a faith. Um, but according to Strong's Concordance, uh, the definition they have here is really, really uh, very good. Faith in God is a little different. They're showing, this is uh, right out of, uh, out of the concordance. Faith is always a gift from God and never something that can be produced by people. In short, faith for the believer is God's divine persuasion and therefore distinct from human belief or confidence, yet involving it. The Lord continuously births faith in the yielding believer so they can know what he prefers. And I've never heard I've never understood it that way. And when I looked it up, it was so eye-opening that it is, I've always known that faith is a gift from God. Ephesians 2, 8 says that, that it is 100% a gift from God. And even, even the, because we have faith, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that we're better than someone else. It just means that God put it in our heart because even that faith was 100% a gift as well as the grace that we receive through it. Um, 1 John 5, 3 to 4. If you want to get your Bibles out, I'm going to go through a few, uh, few different scriptures here. Uh, 1 John chapter 5, 3, 3 and 4. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. I think that's very key right there, that we keep his commands. And his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. 
And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. So through faith, God miraculously takes us out of the victim category and makes us victors because we are victorious over death, over life, and over sin. And I know there's been plenty of arguments about we're still going to sin. Well, we will, but we literally have the power to overcome any sin through the Holy Spirit, which God has given us. When, he, when Jesus left this earth, he said, I will be sending you a comforter, one who will be with you always. Um, our next one is Romans uh, 12, 3. For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but think soberly as God dealt to each one a measure of faith. The amazing thing I've, uh, I found about that is that he doesn't say how much. He just says a measure. So what is a measure? You put it on a scale. Is it going to tip one way or the other? But the most incredible thing is that we just don't, just because we have faith, what does that mean? We need to do something with our faith. Um, so if you, uh, if you know, <clears throat> if you know 100% that your salvation is secure through what Jesus has done on the cross, if you know that Jesus was God, is God, will always be God, came in flesh, Emmanuel, one of his names, God is with us. He came here to experience everything that we will experience as humans, and he has. There's nothing that he has not experienced. There's nothing we can take to him that he doesn't understand. That's why we go, as the Bible says boldly, to the throne with our confessions. He knows everything that we are going through, and he's experienced these but without sin. So if you don't know that Jesus is your Lord God and Savior, who was died, who has died, was crucified and raised from the dead to sit on the throne in heaven, the only thing I can ask you is why not? I was, I was that arrogant guy after he knocked on my door still took 18 years for me to understand that God is king and sovereign over every part of my life. And uh, through circumstances that happened this weekend, it has become clearly evident. My oldest brother checked himself in the hospital. They did emergency surgery and he was on death's door. And what this really brought to me is that we don't know. And he's the guy that we've all thought was healthier than any of us siblings. And it was a matter of minutes. He went from walking and talking to a coma. So this is not, not something we can take the time and just hope, well, I can do this tomorrow. Jesus said, today is the day of salvation because we are not promised the next day. We're not, the only thing we have as a promise is the breath we're breathing right now. And he expects us to do something to glorify him with that breath. So I, at times I uh, get a little somber uh, when I'm preaching, uh, but I like Paul, there's only one thing I preach and that is Christ crucified and resurrected. And what an amazing, amazing God we have to serve. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the creator of all things. Nothing that has been created has been created by anyone but Jesus. It is him. He is our very soul. And as he says, he knew us as he knitted us together in our mother's womb. Before the foundations of this earth were ever created, he knew us. What a great and glorious God he is. 
and that he loved us so much that he would come to take the sacrifice for us, for the sins we committed, including a separation from God the Father that we will never have to take because he has done it for us. And if you answered that you are saved and that you know that you have 100% salvation through Christ, God has given you a different kind of faith than the secular world. He gives them that too, but we have a little different faith. And it all starts with that measure of faith. And what we do with it is really, really critical. Um, if we go to Matthew 25, 14 to 30, it is the parable of the talents. It's really long, so I'm not going to read the whole thing. So I'm just going to summarize it. The ones who invest the most grow the most. The one who invested nothing received nothing. And if you don't, if you don't invest in your faith, it will wither. And one day you'll be asking, "Am I really saved?" But God knows if you are or not, and he expects you to do something with the faith he has given you. It's been, uh, I think, probably the easiest comparison is with faith. It's like our muscles. If we exercise, our muscles get stronger and stronger and stronger. And if we don't, they languish and they atrophy and shrivel. So let's take a, a look, a couple of uh, Bible references that uh, shows what faith looks like. In Luke 7, 1, um, we're going to take a look at, uh, I'm actually going to read this one. It's, it's not too long. Uh, Luke 7, 1. Now, when he concluded all of his sayings in the hearings of the people, he entered Capernaum. A certain centurion's servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. So when he heard about Jesus, he sent elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that one for whom <clears throat> that one for whom he should do this was deserving, for he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. And Jesus went to them, and he was already not far from the house. And the centurion sent friends to him, saying, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Therefore, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed, for I am also a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me. I say to one, go, and he goes. I say to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him. I think that's one of only two times in the New Testament where Jesus says that he marveled at something. And it was both times it was about faith. He marveled at him and turned down around and said to the crowd that followed him, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. So the question is, is do we have the faith of the centurion? Do we trust God for everything? in our life. Um, now we're going to go to Genesis, uh, take a look and see how, uh, what Genesis tells us about faith. In Genesis uh, 15, 6, this is about Abram. And he believed in the Lord and accounted it to him for righteousness. And his very first act was in Genesis 12, 1 through 5. And the Lord said to Abraham, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And in the families of the earth, and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Verse 4, so Abram departed. There's some faith. <laughs> Leave your country. How many of us are going to do that when he says, it's time to go? So the 
Now the question is, though, how do we exercise our faith and how do we get it stronger? What will make us more, what will make us that solid rock of faith that people will just look at and say, that guy's different, that girl's different, they live differently, they prove the love of God every day. And the way we do this is through obedience. And this again is from Strong's. Um, in uh, the Bible, it's used as uh, in the words obedience, submissiveness, compliance. And the literal translation from the Greek is submission to what is heard, which is really, really strong. But what I really like is uh, a pastor I listen to. This is the way he put it. And I just think this is so, it's so enlightening to put it this way. It is to listen with the intent to do or complete. That makes a, a different light on, on the same word. That you're not just bowing down and, well, mom said to do this, but you're literally listening with the intent to accomplish this task. That's amazing. Do you think, do you really think that Abraham, when he moved the country that he thought it was gonna bring the Lord Jesus to this earth? <laughs> I don't think so. He was like, okay, I don't know where I'm going or why I'm going, but I'm going. But man, was it awesome because he kept on being obedient and faithful and time after time after time through the story of Abraham. And uh, Jesus did come through him, through his line. And the most amazing part was he was obedient. That's all it took. We don't know where, we don't know where we're going and God's never going to give us a complete roadmap. He doesn't want us to know. And if we knew, honestly, would we follow it then? Probably not. Uh, I have a story to tell you about uh, the life of Richard. I have a real hard time with his last name, Warmbrand. Uh, probably, I, I don't know how many of you have heard of him. He wrote a book after, uh, after he got out of prison. He was... Uh, he lived during uh, World War I in Romania. He was imprisoned for his Christianity. He was a pastor and he was brutally beaten every day for 14 years. I don't think if God came to him and said, here's my plan for you, have faith in me and I'm gonna let these guys beat you with a rod every day for 14 years. Do you still wanna do it? I don't think that's the way he did it but God always gets us through. He is there. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He will stand through everything that we will ever need. He is the rock of our salvation. And what does all this mean? It just meant one thing. Richard was obedient day by day, minute by minute. He never denied Christ. And I actually saw the movie, the book he wrote is called Tortured for Christ, and they've turned it into a movie. And if you're like me and have a hard time reading things, <laughs> if you see, if you watch, you have a chance to watch the movie, it is amazing. It, uh, you can't watch that movie and not be moved and understand the, the grace of God and the strength that God will give you. Um, our next look at obedience is, uh, let's go to Acts 4, and we're not going to read this because it's pretty much it, it in, 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 entails the entire uh, book of Acts 4. Peter's preaching, preaching, the Sanhedrin arrest him and John, and uh, the Bible says they lay hands on him. And what we know today is laying hands on is they just beat him brutally. They, they got a good beating. And they told him, all right, uh, you're not to preach Jesus or his name or in his name anymore. But what did they do? They went back to the rest of the believers. They all got on their knees, prayed to God. They will have 
the strength to preach in boldness of Jesus and his resurrection. Obedience, again, just like Peter. And I know there's a lot of things that people say. is like, well, but Peter denied Christ three times. And all I can say is, how many times have you denied Christ? That's a hard question. But I know that I have. I don't think anyone in here hasn't. There are times when the Holy Spirit tells us, let's do this. This person needs ministering. You need to talk to this person. You need to be here. You need to be there. When we say, no, today I'm too busy. Tomorrow's not a good day either. We are denying Christ. The good part is, is through Peter's obedience, he kept on and kept on, and he is one of the heroes of the story of Jesus and through the Bible because he came out to be one of the strongest, most evangelistic men in history. And the best part to me is after Jesus was resurrected, he only asked Peter one question. Do you love me? Holy cow, how awesome is that? He knew, he knew he was going to deny him. He foretold, he told Peter to his face, you will deny me. And he did. And yet all Jesus wanted to know is, do you love me? Wow, we have an awesome, awesome God. He is so incredible. And so that's our question. That's his question to us. Do we love him? And in, in the text, it asks him, he asked the same question three times. But it doesn't, he, the first time he asks, he asks him, do you have the agape love? And Peter, of course, cannot agree to that. He's like, no, you know I don't, Lord. The, by the third time, the question is, do you love me? But it's a different kind of love. It's translated from the Greek to mean, do you just have a genuine affection for me? That's pretty simple. It's just the, the love a child has for its parents. Simple, easy. The, that's what I love about the gospel. It is so simple. Children understand it. And those who refuse it, it's not because they don't understand it. It's because they don't want to. You have a choice. So what's our best way to keep obedient and keep on continuing in the love of Christ. He gave us, he gave us that gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit. He is, he dwells in us. God dwells in us, part of the Trinity, God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit, no less God than the Father or the Son, but listening to the Holy Spirit is key. And what precedes everything we do as Christians? Prayer. We need to pray for that. I know when I'm out uh, doing my job and I travel a lot, and the days I don't pray for Jesus to show me who needs to be ministered to, I get nothing. The days I pray, show me who I am to minister to. He shows me. Without fail, God is good. He will fulfill all of your requests in his will. And that's the question. Are we in his will? Being in his, there is nothing more satisfying. I've tried so many things. I chased adrenaline. I chased, chased, I mean, there's, the list is so long, I don't even want to go into it. But there's only one thing that gives you true satisfaction, and that is serving God and serving Him well. When I do what the Holy Spirit says to do, and when I speak to these people, pray with these people, then, and only then, do I have any satisfaction in my life. That is my full satisfaction that... My cup literally does overflow. 
and he will bless you amazingly, amazingly. That's the thing about being obedient. The more you're obedient, the stronger your faith grows. The, every time, every single time, it doesn't matter if it's small or big, sometimes it's just one word to one person in a kind way that he wants us to do. And it just builds and it builds and it builds. You will become the most blessed person that you know. God just pours out blessing after blessing after blessing, builds you up, makes you stronger, makes you want to do God's work more. And how, how simple is this? By being obedient. So through, <clears throat> through this and praying for this, my prayer is that we will do this every day so that when our days end, Jesus will say, they were obedient. How great is that? I know the other words we do not want to hear is, I do not know you. How many? How many are going to say, Lord, Lord? Uh, the next scripture I want to uh, reference is John 14, 15 through 18. And this is a direct quote from Jesus. It uh, doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide in you forever. Oops, sorry, I skipped 15. Let's go back. Verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I pray the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him, for he dwells within you and will be in you and not leave you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. What a remarkable, incredible, awesome promise from Jesus Christ himself. He will come to us. The creator of the universe that he thinks about each one of us. In Hebrews 13, 5 and 6, I just uh, put this in to, to show how we don't need to fear and we, how, to keep, how to keep growing our faith. Because of this, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will fear not. What can man do to me? And that really is a question. If someone threatens me with my life, is that really a threat? Send me to see my Lord and Savior face to face? How remarkable is that, that I would be face to face with Christ if someone took my life? But I cannot, cannot deny Christ. I would rather lay down this life of this earth, for it is so short term. It is literally that vapor they talk about in the Bible. It is shorter than that. My next point is, uh, seems a little odd, but it's really not, uh, the sovereignty of God. Because when we exercise our faith and we go through being obedient to Him, do you really think that that person that has crossed your path from 8,000 miles away that's standing in front of you right now, do you think that was an accident? There are no accidents. God has put him there or her there for you to speak into their life. There is nothing coincidental. If you're here right now today, it's not a coincidence. It's not, I thought I'd just see what's happening. No, no, no. This is God working in your life. There is 100% God's sovereignty in everything you do. He controls and he will guide and direct you in everything. And through your Obedience and the growth of your faith, the blessings that pour, will be poured out on you are so amazing that the things of this world will become amazingly dim. 
So next time you think there's something weird going on, something you don't understand, or you don't know why God wants you to go this direction, instead of asking, why God do you want me to do this? It seems ridiculous. We should be asking, what is your purpose, Lord? Show me, take me, guide me, direct me, and let me be in your will and do your work because that is the only thing that has any value on this earth is being in God's will and doing his work because eternity is a really long time. And for those who are not saved, I grieve deeply. When my brother went in the hospital this week, my only prayer was that I know he's in a coma. But Lord, I know you are the only one that could speak to his heart. I know you can change his heart when he is all but dead. There's only you and you alone, the creator of all. And it is so short. And you only have until you leave this earth to make that decision. And my brother's doing much better. And I just hope that my prayers have been answered, that God has changed his heart. Because he has denied Christ for all of his life. And the, the other thing we have to remember, too, while we're wondering why God wants us to leave the country, <laughs> as, as he told Abraham, and he did, is that he has a plan. He has a plan for us, and his plan is never wrong. And it's always better than our plan. Our plan, <laughs> we have this. Yeah, he's given us the gift of a great mind and lets us have our intellect. And yeah, we can do this, we can do that. But when God speaks, we really need to listen because he's never wrong and he's always on purpose for his glory. Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13. For I know the thoughts I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Wow, that's just amazing. All we have to do is search for him, ask for him, look for him. The sovereignty of God and the design he has for your life is incomparable to anything we can ever come up with in this, on this earth. His, his glory is greater than anything we can, we can even imagine. Heaven is going to be greater than we... There's not a mind on earth that can comprehend what heaven is really going to be like. So what does this mean for us today? Today we need to do certain things. Um, live boldly. Speak the truth to everyone. And when we do that, that's not just with what we say in word and deed. We need to do what Jesus asks us to do. It's not... Do as I say, not as I do. Jesus asks us one thing. Come, follow me. And I think the best, absolute best example of obedience in the Bible is Jesus' own, own words. I do the will of the Father that sent me. Wow. And he never, ever strayed from that. So we serve a God who is kind, loving, patient beyond all imagination, forgiving, and merciful. So we, we need to be too. That's what he's asking us. Follow him. So with our friends, our mothers and fathers, our sons and daughters, our brothers and sisters, and those that we do not know. We need to show more kindness, be more loving, 
more patient. And I think the two key things is the way Jesus forgave us for every sin we have ever committed and the mercy he extends beyond that. So to be forgiving and merciful is key as a believer. It's really easy to not be forgiving or merciful as a believer, and it's even easier to do that if you're not a believer. How many people do you know that will not forgive someone? They haven't talked to him for 18 years, 20 years, because he hurt my feelings. She hurt my feelings. Forgiveness goes a long ways. And the greatest gift of God when he forgave us was not just that we would have everlasting life, but that we can know how to forgive others because now we've experienced the forgiveness, the ultimate forgiveness. No one else can forgive the way he does. So all I ask is that we think about one thing and one thing only as we go on day by day, every task we do, everything we try to complete. There's only one question you need to ask is what I'm going to say or do, does it bring glory to God? If it does not, why are we doing it? If it doesn't bring glory to God, we probably shouldn't be doing it anyway because it's probably evil and of this world that will ultimately bring our destruction. Uh, I thank you for your patience with me, and I am just so, so happy to be here that God would allow me to serve him in this capacity. My God has forgiven me of so much. I love him with all my heart, and I only want to serve him well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father God, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, we know you are God. You are amazing. You love us all. There is no one on this earth you don't love. Lord, I just pray for those who are lost, that you will open their eyes to see, their ears to hear, that they at one point or another will learn To search for you. We're so thankful to be a church body that can meet together, praise you, worship you, and love you. Lord, no, not the way you love us, but the best that we can do. A genuine affection for you, Lord. That's all you ask. Lord, we say this in Jesus' name. Amen.